action. land of brief summers and long winters, where green grass, flowers, trees, and even sunshine are the rarest of luxuries, the descendants of the Vikings have built their homes and reared their children, historically teaching them to carry on the great fight with nature, which is the unfortunate heritage of every child born in this grim land of the Vikings. This is Iceland a beautiful island nation in the North Atlantic, brushing against the Arctic Circle. Formed by volcanic activity thousands of years ago, Iceland has a population of nearly 350,000, scattered across an area of just over 100,000 square kilometers, or about 40,000 square miles, making Iceland the most sparsely populated country in the world. It is also one of the most beautiful there are more than 10,000 waterfalls in Iceland due to the frequent precipitation, and now with a rapidly increasing rate of glacier melt. Iceland is also one of the most volcanic countries in the world. Situated on two tectonic plates, Iceland has 130 volcanoes, and 30 of them are active, with significant eruptions every three years. But the country known as the land of fire and ice has a landscape seldom seen elsewhere in the world, with picturesque mountains, fjords, lava fields, cliffs, sulfur flats, valleys, rivers, and waterfalls. This is the Iceland you probably imagine, but the face of Iceland today is changing drastically. Iceland is known as the land of fire and ice. It has the largest glacier in Europe and is the most volcanic nation on Earth. But as the ice melts due to global warming, the magma rivers that flow beneath the surface are becoming more active with the release of pressure. The rich ecosystems of Iceland are experiencing changes in population sizes among its flora and fauna. As its name suggests, ice covers a large part of this country. However, rapid collapses in Iceland's biggest glaciers are causing concern. Uh, 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 uh. 
And as Iceland's nature and wildlife change, so do its people. Icelanders are enjoying a boom to their economy due to the rise in numbers of the mackerel and eco-tourists. Hydroelectric power from its 10,000 waterfalls and geothermal energy from the ground combine to make 97% of Iceland's energy renewable and sustainable. They are now producing so much energy, they are selling the surplus to its European neighbors. But with this economic windfall, some critics see a danger in the impact of ecotourism to Iceland's fragile ecosystem. What we think of as ecotourism is not necessarily good for our environment, and it's not as well thought through as it might be. According to geothermal tracking data collected by NASA, Iceland sits on top of a hot spot, an upwelling of magma that rises up from deep in the Earth's mantle to just below the surface of Iceland's crust. This impacts on Iceland today, but more than 100 million years ago, it was situated beneath a landmass we now know as Greenland. Now, NASA has used anomalies in Greenland's magnetic field to determine its geothermal heat patterns. Analysis of gravity data contributed to uncovering geophysical information of Greenland's crust kilometers deep beneath its ice sheet. This revealed a path of land movement over geologic time periods. Greenland is today considered part of North America, but it actually moved up from a much more southern location. For tens of millions of years, the Earth's tectonic plates pushed Greenland north and over the hotspot. When the hotspot emerged in the Denmark Strait, it began raising the seabed to form Iceland. The signature of this path of movement exists today, and Iceland sits right on top of it. Much of Iceland's frozen fields and glaciers serve as an ice cap to the magma rivers flowing just beneath its surface. Icelandic nature researcher Savander Dorkelsen explains how the glaciers of Iceland are strong enough to keep a lid on the subterranean magma rivers and minimize volcanic eruptions, for now. You know, once the uh, big glaciers melt down, it may actually make it easier for magma chambers to surge up and, 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 and uh, cause eruptions. We have not had a direct experience with that here in Iceland, but uh, the frequency of uh, eruptions has been consistent. Every uh, sort of four years, we have had that in, in the past, uh, every four years. And uh, it is uh, bound or, or uh, tied to certain places in Iceland, and some of them are covered by glaciers, some of them are not. And uh, when uh, the ones that are, uh, happen underneath the glacier have occurred, this has affected the world the most. Like the uh, 2010 eruption in Eyjafjallajökull. Yukut. You see, ice and, and magma doesn't go well together. You know, the magma or the lava, it has to melt its way through the glacier. And as it does, there is a huge pressure. The glacier is incredibly, incredibly tough. You know, somebody told me if you took all the nuclear arsenal that you have in the world and you placed it under our biggest glacier, the biggest glacier in, in Iceland and Europe, Vatna Yogurt, if you detonated them all at the same time, they would manage to melt down like 1% of the glacier. 1%. And here we have an eruption that is, uh, you know, having uh, taking weeks to melt down through this incredibly tough ice. And as it happens, all this. Uh, the lava is pulverized into ash. And as it breaks finally up, there's a huge amount of water that needs to flow down, of course, but all this ash is emitted into the stratosphere. And if the winds, as it happened in 2010, there's a jet stream that is usually positioned a bit south of Iceland. This was freakish because at the same time we had this eruption coming out of the glacier, the jet stream 
stretched into the land and took a hold of this ash and carried it over to Europe and stranded the flights of so many countries uh, for more than 10 days. The aviation industry has said it has never lost as much money from natural causes, but by Icelandic standards, that was a small eruption. Researchers are becoming more convinced that there is a clear correlation between melting ice and increased magma activity. The 130 volcanoes in Iceland continue to shape the land and its people. Climate change is melting Iceland's ice fields and glaciers at an alarming rate. This is relieving surface pressure from the land underneath. The phenomenon is giving rise to more gas release and movement of the magma rivers that flow underneath. It is feared that this may trigger more volcanic activity in the near future, a cause of great concern and some surprising discoveries to local scientists like Thomas Johannesson and Halador Bjornsson of the Icelandic Meteorological Office. Just uh, 10,000 years ago, Iceland was deglaciated. Then we had a lot of eruptions. And now Iceland is being further deglaciated and that will, with some time delay that is not well understood, lead to, probably lead to more volcanic activity. Do you think perhaps within this, uh, the next 100 years? Yes, I think to the extent that time scale is understood, we may actually already be seeing this. And it's on, yeah, it's on the order of decades that the, the, the time needed for the magma to arise to actually uh, see this effect at the surface. So we, we, we have had glacier uh, downwasting to some extent since the Little Ice Age with some back and forth. Atmospheric researcher Haldor Bjornsson of the Icelandic Meteorological Office concurs with this assessment. The, the main problem with volcanoes in Iceland are the ones that are under glacier. The ones that are under glacier have magma underneath them, that there's a specific temperature under the glacier, under the volcano. The temperature under the volcano is, you know, di differs from volcano to volcano, but that temperature and the pressure environment under it sets the rate of magma production there. Uh, when you depressurize the volcano by removing some of the glacier that's on top of it, it's a little bit like a pressure cooker and you take a little bit of the pressure off, then what's left, what the, the water in the pressure cooker may boil. And this, a very similar process happens in the volcano. That is, the m production of magma suddenly increases because now the pressure has gone down. This magma activity is becoming more visible to the people of Iceland as geothermal activity is rising above ground in hot pools such as this. And with the release of steam and gases such as carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and hydrogen halides. This is the Namafjall sulfur field. Steam arising here can reach temperatures as high as 180 degrees. The hot ground make a hostile environment for any kind of vegetation. And when the pressure gets too great, the inevitable happens. Eruptions such as this one is the result of increased magma activity. And as the ice melts and the magma rivers flow more freely, there is a grave concern that eruptions such as this may be coming soon. Iceland's last major eruption took place in 2010. Ayafjallajökull, a volcano on the eastern volcanic zone in southern Iceland, erupted, sending a plume of smoke and ash across Europe, causing major disruptions to air travel for six days. When lava flows across the land, it takes all life in its path. When it eventually cools, it hardens into ignatius rock, creating lava fields such as this one. These beautiful fields of rock assume many forms, and like clouds, people begin to see shapes. Many Icelanders attribute the legend of trolls to these rock formations, claiming they look like rock during the day, but come to life when the sun goes down.
And while volcanoes threaten to change the face of Iceland in dramatic ways in the near future, one of the biggest changes to the landscape of the country today can be found in its flora. The rugged, rocky landscapes seen throughout the country are seeing new forms of vegetation emerge and thrive. Some of these are anthropogenically invasive species, such as the colorful lupine seen here, imported by the Icelandic government from Alaska. The bright and tall flower is also known as fireweed for its ability to grow in areas of scorched earth, such as land impacted by forest fires or lava flows. Other plants and flowers are finding their way here, naturally carried by winds from other lands. This has always happened in the past, but their success in taking root now has a lot to do with global warming. It is very much affected by soil erosion. We have lost almost all our forests and a lot of our soils, and vegetated area has been going down decade by decade for hundreds of years. And this development is now being reversed by the warming climate, and there is a big increase in forested area. The, the, the soil erosion has stopped in many areas. So the change in the composition of plants, uh, the change in the color of the landscape, uh, and uh, the overall more uh, uh, widespread vegetation is, in most people's opinion, the, the, the uh, biggest visible change. Buoyed by climate change, the beautiful blue, red, and purple species of lupine are growing wild throughout the country. Buttercups, cotton, and fern are also finding common ground and flourishing in soil that was previously unavailable due to cold temperatures and ice coverage. In fact, much of the usually inhospitable rocky landscape is turning green thanks to warming temperatures throughout the land. Even people's homes are growing grass roofs that actually help insulate the house. The Papaver nudicon, or as it's more commonly known, the Icelandic poppy, is becoming more widespread across open fields. They begin as green pods with stems measuring as tall as 12 inches. First identified by botanists in 1759, the Icelandic poppy is flourishing, coloring the landscape with shades of white, pink, orange, and red. Despite its cold climate and rocky terrain, there are close to 6,000 species of plant life in Iceland but you won't find many trees. In fact, the local joke is, if you get lost in a forest in Iceland, just stand up. The loss of trees is attributed to the Vikings. More than 1,000 years ago, 40% of Iceland was covered with trees. The Vikings deforested most of the land to build their ships, and the trees never grew back in the same numbers. Like the lupine, new species of trees from Alaska are being introduced and are showing signs of thriving. While the flora in Iceland is thriving because of changes in the climate, so too are species of fauna. But according to Icelandic nature researcher Svanur Torkelsen, at the peril of other species. The Arctic tern has the longest migration of any animal flying between the Arctic and Antarctica a distance of more than 44,000 miles. About 30% of the Arctic Tern's global population nest for two to three months in Greenland and here in Iceland primarily. Since warming ocean waters have chased away much of the fish the Arctic Tern eats, its population numbers have declined, placing it on Iceland's endangered species list as vulnerable. More than half of the world's population of puffins call Iceland home. The lack of fish have also impacted on the puffins' population numbers here in Iceland. 
After suffering a significant decline in population in recent years, there are some new signs of growth. Still, according to BirdLife International, as of 2015, the puffin is now on the endangered species list in the category of threatened. Iceland's warm waters are also welcoming larger numbers of whales who are contributing to the decline of the population of Kaplan. Marine biologist Pierre Richard has observed an increase in killer whales in particular. We've seen an increase in killer whales, for instance, which are the top predator in the Arctic in the areas where they never used to be. In. And that means that species which were able to find a, a refuge in the ice have no ice to find refuge in anymore. And so they, we've seen, for instance, a narwhal going into areas that's not really particularly a narwhal habitat. They're, they're going into shallow water and they, they hate shallow water. They, they, they're not normally uh, distributed in shallow water, but to evade the uh, killer whales, they'll do it, just about anything. They're terrified of killer whales. And killer whales are going uh, probably uh, several hundred nautical miles uh, uh, further into the Arctic than they used to uh, when I started my career. Most indigenous species of Icelandic marine life have been migrating north in search of colder water and to evade the increased numbers of predatory whales, according to marine biologist and glaciologist Stefan Gudmansen. I have seen some dramatic changes and due to global warming and so on, I mean, firstly, the weather factor. I saw that in 2005, it, it, it was happening like this. We used to have strong winds in between, but when they were changing directions, it came down for maybe half a day and then it started blowing from other direction. Now it's just going from south to north, like bang, bang, more or less. So that, those changes were quite rapid in those 2004, five, six. And then it has been developing the way that we are seeing more and more of those big whales that used to hang out by the west coast of Iceland mainly. So they are all, it's all moving further north. Same with the different species of fish. The big cod used to be mainly by the south coast. Now we have been seeing that here more and more for the past 10 years. Same with haddock and other species coming further and further up north. So yeah, more rapid weather changes, warmer, we have warmer days, we get higher peaks in the, in the, in the heat of the weather. Nature researchers of Honor Torkelson explains how invasive species such as the monkfish seen here had an unattractive appearance that kept local people from serving it at the dinner table. Yeah, the monkfish, uh, uh, for, for uh, many, many decades, uh, of course, we, we used to catch it in our nets and so on, but it uh, looked so ugly uh, that the Icelanders just threw it uh, overboard again. And it, it wasn't until the 70s that they started cutting the head off and uh, really discovering that the rest of the tail actually tastes like lobster. It's the best kind of fish you can get and uh, the, probably the most expensive one as well. Both the flora and fauna here in Iceland changing incredibly fast. Okay, granted, we, we, um, some of this man-made, we planted the trees and so on, but all of a sudden birds are being seen here that never uh, uh, were seen here before, insects that never uh, been here before, and fish that needs cold water coming up from the equator, almost up here into the northern uh, seas, and that is uh, creating a huge uh, imbalance in the ecosystem. The puffins, for example, that uh, have come up here in the millions uh, for many years, uh, their um, population declined down to just a few millions, like three, four millions from seven. They are growing again because that, uh, we have 
caught most of this, uh, the, the competition, which is basically the pilchards that is coming up here into colder water and is uh, eating the sand sail, the, the sand uh, uh, sail, which is the most uh, prominent uh, food of the, of the puffins. We caught them, and this is uh, what uh, um, actually saved Iceland to a degree uh, from the 2008 bank collapse. It was this uh, uh, new fish that uh, all of a sudden became available, was driven up here by um, uh, climatic changes, and then tourism. <laughs> The new warmer waters surrounding Iceland is chasing away much of the food supply of Iceland's seabirds. New species like mackerel have moved here and now represent one of the highest revenue streams for Iceland today. Marine biologist Olafur Astorsen of Iceland's Marine and Freshwater Institute explains. Since about 2005, six, seven, mackerel has been coming to our waters in increasing abundance. And uh, the mackerel is, uh, you could say, uh, a new species in our waters. This has led to a heavy fishery on the mackerel. The exceptional abundance of the mackerel has proven to be a boom to the local economy. The plentiful species now represents the second largest source of income to the country's economy, next to ecotourism. In fact, the fishing industry in Iceland is the second biggest fisheries nation in the Northeast Atlantic, behind Norway, having overtaken the United Kingdom in the early 1990s. Europe's largest glacier, Vatnajökull, is found in Iceland, and like all glaciers worldwide, it too is melting at unprecedented and unpredicted rates. Glaciologists, naturalists, environmentalists, and conservationists are all focusing most of their attention on Vatnajökull as it is receding about 300 meters a year. Glacier researcher Ananda Buretite explains her research revealing some startling statistics. Every single year you can see a change because currently the glacier it is retreating 300 meters every single year. The speed is increasing every single year as well. 20 years ago, the lagoon was about 16 square kilometers big, whilst currently in 2018, it is about 28 square kilometers big. 90 years ago, this lagoon wasn't even existent because the glacier was all the way touching the ocean. So you see, it is normal for glaciers to grow and retreat. It has been like this all over the world with every single glacier. However, 300 meters every single year, it is just unnatural. This uh, glacier is treating a bit faster because of the salty water that the ocean has. Uh, salt, uh, ice melts quicker, so the water has become a little bit warmer. It is still pretty chilly just because you see all the water that comes from the ice picks. It is extremely, extremely cold. So the water has been warming slightly a little bit because of the sunlight. However, yes, the environment has been warmer. So this is the fastest growing lagoon in Iceland. And this is why it is one of the best examples of global warming. I would invite people to come to uh, the Glacier Lagoon of Jokerson and to other lagoons, for example, like Fjarslon there or Heinabergson over there, and just to see the change. And just to hear people, local people speak. I cannot lie, you can see the pictures from, uh, from Google even, that the lagoon wasn't existed 90 years ago. Global warming, it, it, it is what we have today. So it's happening all around the world, not only this glacier, it is shrinking currently. All the glaciers are shrinking. Even this glacier, it is growing every single year, a little bit because we get a layer of snow, but it loses one meter of thickness. It's not only shrinking from the sides, it's also shrinking from, from the, the height as well. A global concern of melting glaciers is how this additional volume of fresh water adds to the world's oceans, causing sea levels to increase worldwide. Recent projections from NASA suggest sea levels could rise by as much as 26 inches worldwide by 2100, should the rate of glacier decline continue. However, Iceland may be immune to sea level rise. As glaciers melt, the land beneath it, fueled by magma heat and gas, may actually rise and alter the country's gravity, as Tomas Johannesson explains. The glaciers uh, are retreating quite fast and thinning. And this has happened 
before in the history of Iceland, the glaciers have gone back and forth depending on the climate for centuries. And during the last century, the glaciers were at a comparatively advanced position uh, at the end of the Little Ice Age. Then, in the early part of the century, they retreated rapidly for 30, 40 years. This was followed by a cooling of the climate, where the glacier, many of the glaciers advanced again by half a kilometer or one kilometer. But in, in the 1990s, the weather became warmer again, and now we are in a state of rapid retreat. A glacier is a frozen river. Although apparently solid, the ice does indeed flow like water in a river, just extremely slowly. This animated model of Vatna Jokul, created by NASA, shows exactly how this glacier, and all glaciers in Iceland, are experiencing what Dr. Johannesson refers to as rapid retreat. Warmer temperatures melt the surface ice of the glacier, causing the warm water to drill down to the rock bed. Once there, it flows downhill underneath the glacier to the bay and eventually the ocean. Once this channel has been opened, it allows the warmer waters of the ocean to flow upstream, causing the glaciers to melt from below as well as above. This is the reason for Vatna Yokel's rapid retreat. This animation provided by NASA shows sea level rise around the world by color. The yellow to red colors indicate areas where the sea levels have been found to increase. The darker the color, the higher the rise. The blue areas, and they are hard to find, show where sea levels have stayed the same and in some rare cases, decreased. You'll see Iceland is in one of these rare and unusual blue spots. This unusual phenomenon is caused by underground gases that raise the ground once the weight of the glacier is lifted. This heavy ice also causes another rare sight in nature, black sand. The sand is created from lava that flowed into the sea and instantly cooled when hitting the water. Its fine composition is the result of the weight of ice grinding the volcanic rock into small stones and the constant erosion of flowing river water and ocean waves grinding it down further to a fine sand. This particular black sand can be found on Iceland's south coast at the tongue of the Vatna Jokul Glacier, a place called Diamond Beach. It is so named for the chunks of ice found resting on the black sand. The rolling waves polish the ice, creating the illusion of giant diamonds cast across the beach. And while it may look like the people of Iceland are well off, with diamonds strewn across their beaches, they derive wealth from another natural phenomenon, energy. The sustainable renewable energy from the land produces so much power, there is enough to sell it to the European neighbors. 25% of the nation's energy comes from geothermal power. Some enterprising people use this natural energy source in unique ways. Here, in Logarvatn, you will find an outdoor bakery where bread, cakes and cookies are all cooked by the steam underground. But the majority of the natural renewable energy that powers Iceland comes from its waterfalls. Hydroelectric power accounts for 72% of the nation's electrical power. According to Iceland's Natural Energy Authority, very little of this energy is used where you might think. While domestic use, like residential consumption, accounts for only 4% of the nation's electrical energy use, the largest consumer by far is the aluminum industry, consuming 71% of all of Iceland's electricity. Aluminum represents the third biggest industry in Iceland, 
behind tourism and fishing. The rapid growth of the tourism industry in the past 10 years is directly related to the rapid growth of ecotourism, the act of visiting places with fragile ecosystems and relatively off the beaten path destinations of natural beauty and curiosity. It is also intended to represent low impact visits in terms of carbon footprints and environmental disruption. However, the sheer numbers of ecotourists today seem to be leaving higher impacts than desired. Here in Iceland, the changing economy has elevated ecotourism to the number one spot, and it is aggressively encouraged through international advertising campaigns such as this one. The word natural must be used with care, but for one small European nation, it is the perfect description because everything about it reflects a natural way of life that is healthy and adventurous. Iceland, naturally. Reykjavik, the capital city, is less than a five-hour plane ride from the East Coast. It's a pretty and safe setting. Geothermal steam heats homes and outdoor pools throughout the city and leaves the air crisp and clean. The lifestyle emphasizes health and wellness. Minutes away from downtown, opportunities abound to enjoy the great outdoors. Iceland is very young in geological terms and everywhere there is the sense of the landscape still being formed. creating a vibrant and ever-changing tapestry. Glaciers cover one-ninth of the land surface. There are 10,000 waterfalls. In the south, there are rock formations and black beaches that whisper of ages past. Throughout Iceland, wild horses abound, purebred for centuries to deal with Iceland's unique terrain and a proud symbol of this rugged and yet sophisticated nation. Iceland, where raw energy and stunning vistas, combined with cultural richness, touches us in a way that is fresh and original. Come see for yourself. Iceland, naturally, awaits. Even local villagers living in beautiful coastline communities like Siglu Fjordor are getting into the act while still practicing their traditional catching, cleaning and salting of fish. They are now making their routine part of a show to both educate and entertain international tourists. But while the additional revenue from ecotourism is a definite boon to the economy of Iceland, there are critics like naturalist Jean Knowles who believes ecotourism comes at a cost. I would suggest that, that we examine more carefully our motivations in, in building a tourism industry because sustainability can help to, uh, to benefit the economy of local communities. Ecotourism can certainly benefit local economies, but if we build too much too quickly, there's nothing sustainable about that. If we come to a point where uh, it suddenly becomes such a popular destination that it becomes overcrowded, that the tourism crashes, that it receives a bad reputation for uh, that lack of sustainability or that lack of foresight and insight into the way that we operate. One of the best ways to ensure ecotourism does not aggravate the conditions of environmental damage climate change has caused and continues to cause, is to apply the guidelines set by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The SDG guidelines provide guidance to how we can all mitigate the impacts of climate change 
and create a more sustainable future for ourselves. Iceland's Prime Minister, Katrin Jakobsdóttir, talks about how Iceland plans to raise awareness among its people to achieve these goals. I was born in the 70s in Reykjavik, Iceland, um, and raised at a time, you know, very political times in Iceland. For example, women's fight for liberation was in full force when I'm a kid. Being raised at times where women are really making, uh, making a stand uh, has definitely influenced me as a politician um, and as a person. If you think about sustainable development goals and their impact on our... In my current job uh, as a prime minister, I just think about politics all the time, so I have become quite a nuisance, <laughs> both in my family and in my friends' group. I have three sons, and they... We actually also talk about politics, but we talk about a lot of other things too. Um, and then, uh, of course, I studied Icelandic literature and I read fiction nearly every day. And that's really a life savior for me to read fiction. It's like a therapy at the end of the day. And then uh, I go out running, uh, which is a, quite a challenge in the weather in Iceland. The SDGs are really all about daily life. They are about the things you do, uh, education, health, but also about uh, how you consume, how you live, where you work, uh, your environment. Uh, the challenge ahead of us when it comes to the SDGs is really how we can make that policy matter and how we can ensure that it's not only policy and not only something we talk about. Well, part of raising the awareness of the SDGs is conveying the message that if this is going to work, we all need to participate. And if you just take one issue, the environment uh, and the challenges that we're faced with there, climate change, etc., it's very obvious that we can't do this just as a government or just as an individual or just as one company. You need the private sector, the public sector, the individuals, the politicians to work together. Raising awareness is just the first step. Then you need to have an action plan. And I think the responsibility of the government there is huge. So, for example, we have now put forward an ambitious goal on becoming carpet neutral. This autumn we will present the plan on how we're going to get there. Uh, the first one of the first steps there will be uh, making the ministries carbon neutral. So that's really how we can show accountability. That is to lead by example and showing uh, concrete ways on how to reach the goals that we are setting forward in our policies. The SDGs uh, are really something that we want to make part to interweave really in all our policy making in Iceland. And the fact is that now I think 80% of the population is living in a health promoting community, meaning that we're implementing uh, health in all policy making in that community. When we're talking about health promoting communities, we're talking about communities that, for example, when they're organizing uh, their cities or communities, they're trying to make making it more easy for people to walk or to use the bicycle than to use the car. They're ensuring the access to water. Uh, they're actually uh, ensuring in their workplaces that there is uh, healthy food in offer and not just, uh, <laughs> not just something sweet <laughs> with fast energy, for example. When I was a student in secondary school, uh, you just went and bought yourself a candy bar. <laughs> but we actually changed all the schools, so the healthy choice was actually the one that was offered for students. I think the, the health promoting communities show that because this is something that everybody sees, you know, that it's beneficial. 
it's always a learning process, really. Implementing uh, international policy making in your own local policy making. And of course, uh, we do mistakes uh, on that way, but that's part of being in politics. You make mistakes on the way. So, uh, and I think uh, the biggest challenge is probably making the SDGs relevant for the daily lives of the people. So, it's really about making that connection from some abstract policy making made in international organization abroad and, and putting them into your local context. And I think, of course, that's the, that's the, the role of the government and, and the prime ministry here in Iceland, is to make these goals relevant for the daily life of the normal Icelandic person. Betri helsa fyrir okkur öll. From melting glaciers and rising magma flows, the release of CO2 and scalding steam, to warming temperatures that impact populations of marine life and birds, the environmental and economic transformations here are unprecedented and show no signs of letting up. The changes we have seen this Arctic island nation experience are symptomatic of the influence of climate change on all our homes, our environments, our planet, and ourselves. Iceland is a beautiful island nation, and with the international cooperation of people and governments, in following the guidelines of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, Iceland will continue to be a picturesque and peaceful land of fire and ice in the years to come. <laughs>